Hey there everyone, this is Leo over at TechLine, and today we're going to be building a PC that I'd like to call the End of Year 2022 Steam PC. And I'm going to put that in quotation marks, and I'll explain a little bit more detail as to why I'm going to be putting it in quotation marks. But, as a lot of you folks, especially those that are in this channel or PC gamers, probably have Steam, which is the main platform that everyone uses to download, install, and play a lot of their games that are online. However, Steam every month always puts out a hardware survey so that way they know what kind of hardware you guys are out there are using. And it's this kind of information that I decided to pick through, look at all the data that was in there, and build a PC based around that information because what are the majority of PC gamers using? and what kind of games are they playing, and what kind of performance can they expect from the hardware that Steam is seeing that they're actually using there. So we're going to be going through the parts that we grabbed over there. We, there's a little bit of elbow room, of course, because everybody's PC is a little bit different, especially if you're custom building it. And we're going to go through the entire build and see what it plays like with the top games that are played on Steam. First, let's get this motherboard out, which I got with a special surprise inside of it. That's right processor right inside this box too came with a very nice combo and this would be the rog strix z370e gaming motherboard now the processor that i have here that came with this motherboard combo that i ended up grabbing is the intel i7 8700k a 3.7 gigahertz processor hex core processor which if we look over at the steam hardware survey checks off three different boxes that we need one the most common processor is intel with six cores but if we look over at the intel cpu speed we're going to notice something a little bit different over here the most common is the 2.3 to 2.6 gigahertz range but the second most common is that 3.3 to 3.69 range and if you look over at the list of every single six core processor that's out there the one that's at that most common range are actually laptop CPUs which we're not using here we're using desktop so for that six core processor we're going for the second place one that's in the Intel speed and that's going to match the exact range that we're looking for over here now for a few more details about the motherboard that we're using again it's the ROG Strix Z370e gaming motherboard it's going to be an LGA 1151 socket for the 8th and 9th gen Intel core processors it's got plenty of M.2 slots on it and it also has of course 802.11 AC Wi-Fi at this point you need Wi-Fi so let's start getting everything loaded onto the motherboard First, we'll start off with some RAM that we're going to add here, 16 gigs of it. And for the storage, we're going to be using an M.2 drive of 1 terabyte. I think at this point, I'm done using 512 gig sticks. We're just going to go from 1 terabyte from now on because you kind of need it. And there we go. Plenty of space for your games, streaming, and OS. Now first let's start getting the installation of all the devices onto the motherboard, first with the 8700K. Careful not to bend those pins. And secured. Now for the M.2, first thing we need to do is put these little standoffs in here to get the 2280 sized M.2 drive on there. Finger is just fine, but if you want to use a pair of pliers, that's good too. Nice and snug. For the RAM, we got to add it to the second and the fourth slot of this motherboard, and it should snap right on in and run it in dual channel mode. Now for cooling, I actually chose this cooler for two reasons. One, it was $20, and two, it actually matches the white aesthetic that I'm going for with this case. It's going to be the Arctic Freezer 34 Esports Tower Cooler. But like with most tower coolers, there's a bit of setup that we're just going to have to go through first. Behind the motherboard itself, we're going to be adding this bracket, as this is what the tower cooler itself is going to be screwing into. So we just flip the motherboard itself down and lay it right behind the slide. You can see the four holes that are there that we could simply just add it right onto. Flip it back over and start the installation. It does come with three different size standoffs. We'll just have to choose the largest one for this specific kind of slot we're using. And we'll just screw it in by hand into these four corners, as this is what the tower cooler itself is going to be mounted into. Now 
Now the tower cooler itself is going to require just a small bit of setup. First, we just got to remove this annoying fan bracket off of this thing. And we're just going to have to screw in these mounts so that we can actually screw the tower itself onto those little pins that you saw that we just screwed into the motherboard. Now I found the easiest way to get these little brackets on there first was to get the screw in there, hold it in, and then just use a little tweezer to get them on there. Now that they're installed on both sides, we can get the processor itself ready. Of course, with just a small little pea-sized dab of thermal grease should just be more than enough for this. With the thermal grease applied, we're ready to mount the actual tower cooler that we have here. So we just need to get it mounted onto the standoffs that we screwed onto the motherboard, as it'll just follow the holes exactly here. Lastly, to fully secure the tower cooler onto the motherboard, we just need to screw in the thumb nuts into all four of the corners, and that'll keep it nice and snug on there and it's not going anywhere. And to make sure that we're not losing any pressure onto the processor, we're of course getting a screwdriver out and screwing down every one of these thumb nuts to make sure that the tower cooler isn't going anywhere. Last step for the tower cooler is to actually get the fan back on there so that way it's cooling something. Make sure that the arrow that's on it is pointing outwards as it's going to go towards the exhaust. And we'll snap it onto the tower and plug it in after. And we'll just need to make sure to plug the fan into the CPU pins, not the CPU optional pins. And with that, just going to tuck the wires away and the tower is good to go. And just one final check of the motherboard and all of its components to make sure everything is nice and snug on in there. We got the M.2 drive that's properly installed, the 8700K is nice on in there, the tower cooler that's going to be cooling it down, that's on on there as well, and of course the two sticks of RAMs are in the proper slots this time around. So let's just get the case open and get this installed. But before we do that, this video is brought to you by us over at TechLinePCs.com, where you can check out our store for custom mid-range builds along with our consolation page, where you can fill in whether you'd like an upgrade, a new build, a pre-built PC, along with a budget, and we'll work with you on the PC of your choice. Check us out again over at TechLinePCs.com. Now let's get this case unboxed. Here's a nice full side profile of the NZXT H10 case that we have here. Let's look over on this side where we can see that there is a side intake area. This is where all the holes are since the front area is a completely sealed off front panel. Over here on the top, we got the power button, the USB 3 port, and the USB-C port as well. And if we zoom a little bit over here over towards the back, we see that there is the second exhaust fan that we're actually going to be moving over towards the front just so we can get a bit more air into the tank. Use the thumb screws, and it's popped on open. And we can see the top exhaust that's over here, which we don't really need two exhaust fans, but we do need an intake. So let's just take this guy off and move it up towards the front. Now this case actually has a front panel that we could remove that we can mount fans onto separately. And once we remove this little fan bracket that we have here, we just gotta align the holes for the fan itself. And I realized afterwards I should have flipped it over to begin with. And we can just screw the fan right back onto the front panel and mount that right on afterwards. Now there's actually enough space on this front panel that we have over here for a second 140 millimeter fan, or if you're so inclined, you can get a 280 millimeter AIO and mount it to the front for your cooling solutions as well. Now that we've got the fan moved over towards the front, we can simply just mount it right back on into the case and use the thumb screw to put it right back on in there. Now for the power supply, we actually have ourselves a 650 watt EVGA, rest in peace graphic card division, fully modular power supply. Plenty of ports for us to use. 
And of course, we only really need three of them. One for the CPU, one for the graphics card, and one for the motherboard itself. From there, we'll just slide the thing right on into the bottom area with the fan facing downwards so it can get proper cooling. And we'll just get it screwed into the case from there. Uh, just don't do what I did on the uh, first time around where I screwed it into the honeycomb as opposed to the actual screw holes that are there. Sorry. And from there, we'll get the motherboard itself into the case. And there's a little standoff plug that we can snap it on in there, which will help keep it in place. Now the motherboard sitting inside the case, we just have to screw it down to make sure it's properly mounted inside. Now with the motherboard mounted, we can start sneaking in all the power cables. Fortunately, there's some really good cable routing already in this case, and I kind of love it already. Next, we'll sneak in all the front panel connectors, including the audio ports and the USB connectors. Now that everything is sneaked through, we can start plugging everything in, like the front fan, the motherboard power, the USB-C port, and the USB 3.1 port. And lastly, the power button, which by the way, huge shout out to the front panel plug. I wish more cases had something like this. It's just a single plug that you gotta put into these pins and you don't have to mess with a dozen of them. And of course, one more, the audio jack. And now the final component for our case, the graphics card. What we're gonna be using here is going to be the 1650 Super. Though technically, the Steam chart shows the 1650 non-Super variant. But what I ordered and what I received were not the same thing. But I'm like, hey, if I paid for a 1650 but I got a Super, that's what I'm gonna be working with over here. So if you can see, it's gonna match the aesthetic, of course, of that black and white look that I'm going over here. This one's mostly black. Just use the single six pin connector on the back for power. And it's gonna be more than enough to play all the games as we can see a little bit later. First, let's get this bracket removed here and the slots that we need to open up so that we can actually slide the card in here. And of course, installing the card itself, which in a world of giant three slot massive graphic cards, it's kind of a breath of fresh air to just be able to take a two slot card, plug it in, put six pin power, and you're good to go. And of course, screw it back into the case to make sure it doesn't jiggle or slide around anywhere. I actually realized afterwards that I forgot to plug in the CPU power. I usually do this a bit earlier, but we can still just get this snapped on in there. And of course, the moment of truth, powering it on. That's exactly what we'd like to see there. Let's just pop into the BIOS and make a couple of changes that we need. First thing, I always want to make sure that everything I plugged in is working, which of course we see that case fans there, we got XMP turned on, the two six of RAMs are being detected, and yeah, it does detect basically everything that we plugged in. And of course the temperature, absolutely cool. But what I want to actually turn off here is the RGB lights that the motherboard itself has. It's glowing red, I'm keeping to the black and white aesthetic, so we're just going to turn off the red LEDs that are flashing on. And with that, let's get Windows installed and test out a couple of games. So when looking at the top list of 100 most played games on Steam, a lot of them are actually going to be free to play esports titles that are played. Apex, Counter-Strike Go, Dota 2, PUBG. These are some fantastic titles to play with this kind of a system. So let's just run a couple of the benchmarks, and which I already did. And let's post a couple of them here and just kind of go over the numbers that I've discovered while playing this system. 
So first I'd like to go over some of the oldest titles that they have in this list, which the numbers are preposterously high for this setup. For Counter-Strike Go, we're hovering around somewhere between 270 FPS, Dota 2 is giving us, oh, what are the numbers say over here, 215 FPS, and even GTA 5, all of these are running at 1080p high, by the way, 135 FPS. Fantastic for this kind of a setup. And then if we skip on over to some of the newer titles, Apex Legends, PUBG, Elden Ring, Warzone 2.0, we can actually achieve over 60 FPS in all these games, except for Elden Ring, which is a locked 60 FPS. But every one of these are running at 1080p on high. Apex Legends, 80 FPS, 1080p high. PUBG, 90 FPS, 1080p high. Elden Ring, 60 FPS locked, of course. If the engine allowed us to go higher, it probably would. The only one of these games that had to run on medium settings was Warzone 2.0, which 7 the FPS average at 1080p, completely playable experience, and I think this is actually pretty good for this kind of a system. And I think that kind of says a lot when it comes to looking at the kind of games that you play that you were planning on playing when you're specking yourself out of system in a world where there's a thousand dollar video cards like the latest 7000 series of AMD graphic card and even the newer 4000 series, even the 4070, the 4080 and the 4090. Those are all very expensive, but you can really build an entire system for the cost of one of those graphics card and have a fantastic 1080p gaming experience. Well, if you have any questions, please leave a comment down below. And until next time, this is Leo signing off.